Captain Gordon Vett. Captain Gordon Vett climbed into the left-hand seat of the great DC-10 airliner. And after getting the clearance to taxi, taxied out to the end of the runway at Nandy Airport. Lined up, ready to fly to Auckland, New Zealand. It was just after five o'clock half past five in the afternoon. He calls the tower. Nandy, this is Air New Zealand 103. We're ready to take off. Air New Zealand 103, you're clear to take off. Three huge engines revving up harder, faster and faster and faster. And then all of a sudden, they release the brakes and down the runway goes the aircraft, roaring down the runway, the lights on either side, which has already been switched on, flashing by. And then, of course, the, the usual conversation in the cockpit. V1, V1, rotate, rotate. And the aircraft clears the runway and headed off into the sky, climbing, climbing, climbing climbing up to 33,000 feet, the normal cruising altitude of a typical jet liner today. As they're climbing up, a little bell went in the cockpit. Ding, ding. Go ahead, tower. And from the tower below, we've just received a distress call from a little aircraft, a Cessna 30771 is the call sign. Now, we believe he's somewhere out to the west of you. We don't know exactly where, but he sent a mayday call. He sent a mayday call, and, and who knows, when you get to the top of climbing, give him a call on VHF. You never know, he might be in range. Now, what was the idea of this? Obviously, once the aircraft got up to the top of 33,000 feet, its footprint, as far as the radio signal of VHF, would be enormous. Now, what do I mean by a footprint? You've probably got an aerial on the roof of your house, a TV aerial. And if that TV aerial is in line of sight, or just over the horizon from line of sight, from the transmitting aerial tower, you'll get a good signal. But if you're too far away, over the curvature of the Earth, you won't get a signal at all. The point being made here is the higher the aerial, the bigger the radius in which someone can see the signal or hear the signal. And in this case, with an aircraft up at 33,000 feet, the signal can be heard for hundreds of miles around the aircraft. If they could get the little lost Cessna, within that area, they could then work out where it was. And from once they could work out where it was, they could render assistance and direct it to Norfolk Island. So that was the idea. The aircraft, the big, big jumbo jet climbing higher and higher, eventually reaches top of climb. Nandy, Nandy, Air New Zealand 103, we're top of climb at 0600 Zulu. We're going to go across and give this fellow a little call on 121.5. Arthur, give him a call, mate. The co-pilot leans forward, switches on his radio, up onto 121.5 and calls. Cessna 30771, Cessna 30771, this is Air New Zealand 103. Air New Zealand 103. Do you read me over? Just that long, very high, faint static that you get on VHF. No reply. No reply. Well, looks like he's not in range, mate. Then Captain Gordon Vett decided something. He said, Arthur... Go over on 8845. We'll give him a call on VHF, on, on HF. Maybe he'll hear us on HF. 
And that's what they did. They went across to the HF frequency. Now remember, an HF frequency is different from VHF. VHF is line of sight. But HF rebounds off the ionosphere. It's refracted and covers a much wider area. So, they called him. Cessna 30771, this is Air New Zealand 103 on 8845. Do you read over? And then comes back the reply. Air New Zealand 103, this is a Cessna 30771. I'm reading you loud and clear, buddy. How do you read me over? So they've established contact. But now it gets problematic. But Captain Gordon Vets, as I said, he was a veteran pilot. He was nearing the end of his career as an airline pilot. And he had a vast experience. And he knew that the young pilot, the young ex-Navy pilot in the Cessna, would be feeling pretty anxious at this time. And he wanted to calm him down, so he said, Cessna 30771, this is Air New Zealand 103. This is the captain speaking here, mate. My name is Gordon. Now, what's your name, son? And he established a sort of a rapport with him over the year. Now, these things were unheard of. You just didn't do it. But Gordon Vett knew that it was pretty important to make the young pilot feel safe. So he said, what's your name, son? And when he got the name, he said, now, where are you going? And he got all the details. He had them already, but he just, just chatter. And then he said, OK, now, what's your flight level? Flight level is 8,000 feet. Roger, mate. Now, listen, you're getting a headwind there. Now, what I suggest you do is drop it down very, very slowly. Just let it drop under our own weight virtually. Take it down to 6,000. You won't get such a strong headwind component there. And... Uh, what I'd like you to do is keep keep giving me a call every so often. Every two minutes, give me a call. And of course, Jay Proch now acknowledged that. And then he said, Jay, um, I'm getting a bit worried about this. He said, I, I want you to try a little experiment. I, I can't find out where you are. He said, do you have a sextant on board? Jay Proch now said, oh, sextant? Captain Cook used those, didn't he? No, no, I don't have anything like that. He said, all right, we'll have to improvise. This is what I want you to do, Jay. I want you to put your hand out in front of you, right against the, right against the windscreen glass, turn it side on, so that your thumb's at the top. Now, tell me, tell me how many fingers between the setting sun and the horizon. Pope, your little finger at the horizon. Tell me how many fingers to the centre of the sun. Now you're going to have to swing around, swing around and point that way. So in the little aircraft, he, he takes notice. He swings the aircraft around slightly and he's now pointing at 270 degrees directly west into the setting sun. How many fingers you got there, son? He said, I've got about about four, about four fingers, maybe three and a half. Right, right. Now I'm going to do the same here. So in the huge airliner, he puts his hand out in front of him. Roughly what he thinks is the same distance to the windscreen of the little plane. Counts off and he says, now I've got about one finger here. Now that puts me so many, I reckon, so many hundreds of miles to the east of you. Now... I'm showing 273 degrees, you're showing 270, right? That's correct. So all this time he's working out in his head, this is Gordon Vett, working out roughly, roughly where the little aeroplane is. And that's when he makes a decision. Now if you'd have been in that aeroplane on that day, sitting in amongst the passengers, You'd have heard something like this. Ladies and gentlemen, this is your captain speaking. We have just received some information 
that there's an aircraft, a little aircraft, somewhere out to our west that's in trouble. It's in big trouble. It's lost. Now, we're in the position to perhaps render him some help, which means, of course, I will be diverting to the west to see if I can render that assistance. Now, this real, you realise, of course, that this will make you late into Auckland. We will be in later. Now, if you have any objections to this, any objections, come up here and see me on the flight deck. Well, you can imagine silence amongst the passengers as they thought about it. Suddenly one man gets up carrying a briefcase, stomps along the central aisle, bangs on the cockpit door and then goes inside. There's always one, isn't there? Always one. But luckily this one was an off-duty airline pilot. Another airline pilot working for Air New Zealand and a very experienced navigator. And as he came in, the other two pilots, Gordon Vett and Arthur Doty, look around and they say, well, come on in, mate. Come on in, Malcolm. We didn't even know you was aboard, son. Come on in. You've got your charts? Of course, I never go without them. And then the two senior pilots, Malcolm Forsythe and Gordon Vett, decided that they would take a look at helping the little aircraft off to the west. They got out their charts and that's when they started to get really serious about finding the lost crop duster. All right, Jay. Now, what I want you to do is this. Looks like the sun is going down. You're going to be in darkness soon. We'll be a bit lighter up here for a while. What I want you to do is I want you to come back Swing around 180 degrees and come back over the same course. Swing around 180 degrees, come back over your own course. Negative, negative, says Jay Proch now. Negative. Nothing there but open ocean. I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to do that. Besides, look, look, I'm going to, I'm going to do a forced landing. I've got, I've got some survival gear. That's when Gordon Vett went right off the, the deep end. Don't you do that. Don't you do that. If you crash into the sea, that's the end of you. We can't help you then. Besides, you've got a fixed undercarriage. She'll, she'll tip up. She'll tip up. Don't do it. Stay in the air. Stay in the air as long as you can. And so Gordon Vett browbeated the younger man into staying in the air and coming back on a 180 degree zero, 180 course. Now the two aeroplanes are coming towards each other like this. The one coming in from the northeast is doing the 500 knots. The one coming in from the southwest going to the northeast, the little plane, is doing 100 knots. They're closing at each other at six over 600 miles an hour. Keep giving us a call, Jay. Every three minutes now, We'll get you on VHF any time now. And sure enough, that's what happened. Arthur Davies says, what? We've got him. We've got him now on one, two, one decimal five. All right, Jay, we've got you on VHF. Stay on VHF. Keep calling every three minutes. Every three minutes, we'll get a fix on you. And this is what was happening. The aircraft were coming towards each other at a greater rate. But now, in the little plane, Darkness had fallen. Darkness had fallen. But in the big plane, they were still high in the air with sunlight streaking across their wings. And you'll hear a little bit more about what happened in part four of this story.